Okay, uh, welcome everyone to this model on researcher awareness and research integrity. Um, and this is part of a series of workshops that their ethics and society work package of the HPP is offering to their, not only to the HPP, but to the broader community, to everyone who is interested in responsible research and innovation. We are trying to build capacities and reflections and uh, share experiences that can be built in in the next um, uh, research infrastructure that the HPP is building, which is eBrains. And because we think that uh, excellent science uh, has to be scientifically robust, and that, that means also to be ethically sound. And the same goes to the responsibility when we are designing new technologies and when we are working with something so delicate and complex and important as the human brain. And in this opportunity, um, um, under the umbrella of uh, Human Brain Project's Researcher Awareness Task and the Ethics Rapporteur Program, we have invited uh, Professor Stefan Eriksson from the Center for Research Ethics and Bioethics, um, which is based at uh, Uppsala in Uppsala University. Uh, Professor Eriksson is a senior researcher um, or um, professor in research ethics and is the director of the, of the CRB, of the Center for Research Ethics, and is one of the most prominent persons in Sweden that, that deals with um, research ethics and, and in that way with research integrity um, matters as well. In the HPP, we have our, on, on our own structure that, that works with research integrity, but it hasn't been uh, so much highlighted. So we thought that it's, it's time to link researcher awareness to research integrity, also in a such a big project as the Human Brain Project. And that's why we invited Professor Stefan Eriksson that can give us a presentation. And after this uh, presentation, we can have um, uh, a, a round of, of, of opinions, reflections, and conversations with all of you who are attending this, um, this workshop. Um, so uh, I will give the word to, to Professor uh, Erickson, and after his presentations, we will come back to the gallery where everyone can, can join the, the, the dialogue. So uh, Stefan, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to speak about my favorite subject. So uh, I have an outline here. I was told to speak for a maximum 30 minutes. So I will go through uh, quite a few pages, uh, slides during that time, but no worries, you will get them uh, after it. Basically, what I will do is just to present what is good research practice through the ALEA principles. Ask, why do we care? And I will give some examples of challenges for a trustworthy research and the, the believable research today. But the main questions would be, how do you set up a project to make sure your research is trustworthy and have integrity? And I will first look at like high level principles from a European Union project called Satori, which you might call excellence criteria, but then also look at the printing principles, which are really dealing with evidence-based, what do we do in practice? What works in order to promote good research practice and some kind of conclusion and then discussion. So first, what is good research practice? I would say that uh, one good source is the European Union Code of Conduct for Research Integrity by the all uh, European academies. They try to spell out good research practice in four fundamental principles. So they speak about reliability, all through the work in a project, to be honest, not only in developing, but also in reviewing, reporting, communicating, of course. Uh, transparency is a key notion there to show respect for those you work with, but also for society and ecosystems and so on. And to be accountable for what you do from the ID to the publication and through all those that are affected by your research. So that's an ID and uh, many different ways of spelling out what good research practice is, but this is uh, as good as any else, anyone else's uh, suggestions. So do we have it? Why is this topic important? Because we have a suspicion that we are not really succeeding in science in doing this. Uh, the first time I really took notice was by, by a, 
and the last editorial by Marcia Angel in the New England Journal of Medicine, where uh, this editor wrote as the very last editorial, it is simply no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reached slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. So this is a person that should know, if any, seen all the high ranked and cutting edge research being done for two decades and had lost the belief in it. And I thought for myself that if this is the case and it becomes known to the public, to journalists, we are in a problematic situation. So I was set out to try to find out, is this true? Now, there is a lot of concerning uh, things out there. One is the reproducibility crisis. Uh, this is one example when they looked at psychology studies and saw that most of them, or around half of them, couldn't be reproduced. And it seems that people are really keen to publish two positive results. So they choose experiments, they do go data fishing, and so on. And there's a lot of explanations for this, but it's hard to reproduce. And we become worried that is there a problem in science? Retractions is on the rise. So here is one from the PLOS uh, one. You can see, and it's been a very steep uh, development after 2018. And you might say, well, it's just because we are better now to check out whether there are bad research out in the literature. But when we look at the causes for retractions, it's pause for thought, I think. Uh, the, all the red yellow ones here is misconduct or fraud. So the ma majority of retractions is part is is because of people doing bad things. So sociologists and uh, research ethicists trying to look into why do people misbehave. They have seen that one empirical uh, correlation is between competitiveness and fraud and misconduct. Uh, the Belisa Anderson group is one that have looked at that and we can see that link very clearly. Um, this can be shown, for example, in how we deal with publication ethics. Um, I was uh, hearing there was a book called The Return to Meaning by a scholar called Alveson in Sweden that I heard uh, middle October in 2018. And he claimed that we are basically trying to published because there's something in it for us. And I sort of, yeah, maybe. And then we got this big survey from China just a few weeks later that most Chinese scientists write academic papers to get promoted survey finds. While you think that they should get published because they have something important to say, that does not no longer seem to be the primary reason to publish. To tie in with this, before we end this, these few examples of problems, uh, I would say that there are also a lot of actors trying to exploit this need for competitive uh, edge uh, or uh, for researchers to, to, to um, get ahead in the race for promotion, funding, and so on. Matt Hodginson was uh, the first to, to take notice of something that he called industrialization of misconduct. Speaking with him, he's, he means that it's two parts to that. One is that it's a large-scale operation that is working, and one is that it's done for money. And ever since I heard of this uh, six years ago, I've tried to collect examples. I will give you a few of them. One is that you can buy papers. There are paper mills, well-known fact now. This is from a Russian paper mill where they say that for three years we have published more than 2,000 articles with more than 10,000 scientists in Scopus and the Web of Science. And they are very happy to say that our satisfied customers will recommend us. They can call. We are not cheap because we guarantee publication on 100%. So it's a brokerage of uh, papers that you can just pay to become an author of. Plagiarism. There are a lot of services out there to cover up if you plagiarize to get ahead, it's easier to copy than to write your own text. Uh, for a long while, we have to use sort of language editing firms that did it for money, but now there are, yes, you can 
subscribe to a service online. Uh, so you just put in your text, they will paraphrase it for you, check it with a, a authenticator or something like that, a plagiarism checker, and then give you the paper that can't be found to be plagiarizing. But still it is. Researchers are manipulating citations. Uh, Elsevier here investigated hundreds of peer reviewers for manipulating citations. We hear about this every week nowadays. Uh, one form of this was brought to my attention by a colleague of mine here at Uppsala University, Johan, Johanna Lindahl. She had gotten this email and sent it to me. Dear Lindahl, how are you? My name is Chang. I'm from China. I'm a businessman. My business is about citing for money. So it turns out that you can put in a reference to a paper that someone pays to get into your paper and you get 50 US dollar for every such paper. So this businessman say you will get 400 US dollar if you put eight references in. So may, this might be one of the reasons that we find uh, citations and references that do not, does not really stand up to scrutiny. My last example, the one that has mostly been uh, my attention is predatory journals. Um, this is the book that collects a lot of papers that have been used in sting operations to expose such journals. It's very funny. You should read it if you haven't. It's, uh, you will laugh. Uh, it's academic humor on a large level. But uh, what they do, these predatory journals, is of course to take your money and publish whatever you send them without any peer review, without any proper editorial oversight. It's just commercial publishing for the sake of the money, uh, disregarding any academic uh, virtues. So that was just a few examples of what we fight with in uh, trying to promote uh, good research practice. So let's move to the next question. How do you set up a project to make sure your research is trustworthy and have integrity? Well, as I said, there are two levels of answers here. And one is more on the level of being criteria for excellence, which you, Manuel, also mentioned at the very start of this seminar. Uh, and uh, I turn to Satori, which is a good uh, European project that tried to summarize what we expect from scientists and what we should be keen to integrate in our projects. So they have eight principles here. And the first is research integrity. I will go through this rather quickly because they are on a high level and not very practical, pr pract in, in, usable in practice. So they speak about the methods you use, so that you should avoid misconduct, that you should avoid all practices that undermine integrity and trustworthiness. Secondly, about social responsibility, that you should raise awareness of societal impacts and try to remedy any problems that you find. Thirdly, that you avoid uh, and have openness about potential conflicts of interest. You should have awareness in all your projects and be transparent about any potential conflicts of interest. Fourthly, that you protect and respect human research participants. That means to respect their consent, autonomy, dignity, to minimize the risk of harm to them, and to fairly distribute benefits and burdens and the benefit should outweigh all the risks of harm. Further, the same can be said for, about respecting animals if you use them in research. You should reduce the use of them, and if you use them, you should reduce the suffering and make the experiment as good as you can. Then, next to last, you protect uh, and manage your data. Make sure you have consent for the collection, use of personal data, and make sure you have security for storing and managing the data. You should also protect researchers in the research environment. Uh, so that is important to remember that you should ensure, ensure that researchers and staff involved doesn't are subjected to any particular risks and problems. Uh, but this also goes for the local community that you work in, that you look at your environment and maybe even things like the cultural heritage. And last, when you disseminate your research results, you should make them preferably publicly available, not least by or using open access publications. Now, I think this is a typical uh, Satori project. They spent years to create this list of important principles. 
what you should do, but it's not very much a workable, practical thing to say to anyone. Uh, so what can you more in practice do? And then we look to uh, the best project I've seen is the Printiger project in Europe. Uh, they try to be really evidence-based. So they try to promote key measures that actually work. And now uh, some of them are more applicable to a project like HPP than others. So I have chosen the five uh, key measures and some of the few uh, other eight ones will tie in with these five, but I will um, end this talk by looking at these five uh, practical evidence-based uh, suggestions on what measures to take. The first one is in paragraph one, provide accessible information about research integrity. If people cannot access readily available information, uh, it's hard to keep up with demands and to get help on what to do. Um, to exemplify this, I have this here. Here's the staff portal from Uppsala University, but I really have tried to make a research ethics page, which is one side about permits and ethical review, another page about uh, tools that you can use. There are courses and lectures on research ethics, and there are contact and advice to who you can contact. Something like this is very workable. It gives people access to readily available things that they can use. So this is a, a thing you can do. Um, there you can also put a lot of different tools um, things that you can use. For example, if you look at predatory journals, which I mentioned, it's very useful to have something like Cabels. It's a list of predatory journals. So this is the first page. Uh, you can see the very first in an alphabetical list. And you, as you can see, there were over 15,000 journals when I took this screenshot. Now it's over 16,000 journals in this list. So if you are ever in sort of starting to have the suspicion that this journal that I'm planning to publish with or getting a paper from that I will cite. Uh, might it be predatory? Might it not have been subject to peer review? You can just check it with such a tool. And you can think of many different tools like this, of course, where you can uh, get uh, keep track of different things. The second suggestion they have in the printer is that uh, you can find in paragraph 13, make explicit applicable standards for research integrity. Um, I think this is a three tire thing. First, just mention them. Just make sure that you can find them and that you make explicit, this is what we expect you to follow. So for example, at Uppsala University, we readily say that, well, if you are reported for having some publication authorship issues, we will look at the Vancouver rules in order to deal with, with the complaint. So for example, this, these are the Vancouver rules that are the most used in, in uh, the research world for co-authorship authorship when we write together for criteria for who should be an author. And we explicitly say that this is what we will start, use as a starting point. We will look at what you are, uh, what kind of uh, practices you have in your field, but this is the starting point. But secondly, uh, when we talk about making it explicit, I think we should also strive to explain why this is a useful norm. So uh, this is the way I do it. I have a little film on our web webpage where I try to explain the, the point of the Vancouver rules. Namely, if we look at those four criteria and we turn them around and start with the fourth, we can see that you need to follow these in order to have accountable research. So to be able to assume responsibility, criteria number, criteria number four, to be able to answer questions about the paper, you need to have accepted the article sent in and understand what is reported in it. That is, you have to have read it and worked with the text. And that is only possible to actually understand what is reported if you have substantially worked with it and taken part in the actual work. So you can move from the accountability to the very start, the first criterion. You need to have taken part in the work. Then you are an author. So it's, it's about the credibility of science to have accountable science. We wouldn't call it science if we have 
authors who aren't accountable for the things they publish. If they don't understand what they publish, if they can't answer questions, so, so this is the way you can make explicit why it is a standard, why this is a normative thing for a scientist. And third, uh, when it comes to this uh, measure, I think we should also have practical tools in place that we can help people uh, sort of make use of authorship and deal with it together. So these are two examples. Uh, the ease, it's the European Association of Science Editors. They've made a checklist for authors when it comes to ethics. So here you can just, if you say that, yeah, every time you publish a paper with HPP, make sure to check the checklist and sign it as the corresponding author, for example. Make sure that you are actually aware of these things and have checked it. Another way of doing it is to the right here, you can have uh, authorship templates. A lot of universities use them. This is the Uppsala University one. So it's a model authorship contract, if you will, uh, an agreement and co-authorship for the following article. Here you can put in the names of the people that should be there, what they are to do, what order of authors you should have, and everyone sign it to say, this is what we expect everyone to do and what kind of order we will have. And this is useful because most, if you have an agreement on it before you start, it's not about you thinking about things and having assumptions. It is something that you have actually made explicit and said that this is what we expect. This is what we think we will do. The third measure uh, that I think is applicable from Printiger is provide education, training, and mentoring. And of course, this workshop is just one example of this. Um, but I think the most important thing to when we think about that paragraph is to say that we actually do what we see. And there are a lot of empirical work that suggests this. Uh, this is a very old one from 96, but I think it's so nice. It was a survey to 1,005 postdocs about publication ethics in biomedicine in the US. They asked them, would you be likely uh, uh, to list an undeserving author on your paper. And if, if they thought it would benefit them, uh, one out of three said, yes, I would be prepared to do something like that. But if they had seen this happen in the group or to themselves, three out of four said, yes, I'm prepared to do it. And I think that the conclusion of Eastwood et al. here is very uh, significant. The research environment is a powerful component of a trainee's experience in ethical development. We do what we see. And this means that education and training might be good, but I think mentoring is the most important thing to, to stress here. Because instruction, if we look at that, it's a lot of empirical research on instruction in good research practice. It's usually a null result. It doesn't accomplish much. It might be important anyway to do it, but it's not something that changes people's behavior. If anything, people will behave more badly. Because if I go there and I say, for example, you shouldn't salami slice, one in a group of 30 will think, oh, that was smart. I will do it the next time. So it's really a negative result. If you mentor in survival in science, you raise the odds for people behaving badly. But if you mentor in ethical behavior and good research practices, you have a significant correlation with better behavior. Or again, this is the Anderson group, and I think it's significant uh, to, to say this. The fourth measure uh, that Printiger suggests are strengthen a research integrity culture. They point to the fact that organizational culture is one of the most influential factors for individual conduct. This ties in very well with what we just said with the Anderson Group. And this involves sharing, giving substance to norms, values, and beliefs. And we need them to have incentive structures and think about how do we incentivize people to do right and not bad. They also see that it's the responsibility of the top and middle management, and it's really important that leaders should be good role models. 
this this uh, is really stressed by them. I will come back to that. The fifth and last point, uh, it's in paragraph four in the printer document, is uh, facilitating open dialogue. I think this is extremely important and workable as a measure. We need to make sure that we have a climate where we allow for critical questions. Too many times I hear, for example, PhD students that I teach coming and say, I ask my supervisor or my colleague, you succeed so well, very well with your data. Can I see how you work with them? And they just say, no, you can't. Something fishy is going on then. You should be allowing for interest in what you do, critical questions. How do you succeed? How do you get those data? And we should have that as an expectation because that is science. Otherwise, we are not in scientific in a scientific endeavor, I would say. Sometimes when people start to ask questions and expect to be having a critical discussion, they upset others. Then it's important to have a support structure in place. Uh, if people are retaliating or sort of neglecting people's questions, we should really have a support structure to give them proper space and to facilitate open dialogue, not letting it be suppressed. It might even go so far as in the paragraph number 10 in the printer here, that we need uh, in the worst case to actually have whistleblowing uh, channels in place just if, if, if it's not allowed to raise critical questions. Um, I think also that you could say that uh, the ninth paragraph, opening up research, ties very well in with facilitating open dialogue. You can do it in many ways, by the ethics workshop, by public seminars on ethics, or by doing things like uh, registering a research protocol before you start, by sharing your data sets, all what we call is open science. It's important to opening up the research that makes it possible to facilitate open dialogue in a wider meaning. I think that is important. So that was the five, I think, actionable measures that Printiger uh, suggests. And I will end and I put this at the end and then I thought maybe I should have had that this uh, as the very first slide, but uh, I pondered that for a while, but I put it last because now you know what Printiger is. I just wanted to say that Printiger really emphasizes that the responsibility for ethical research lies with everyone who is engaged with research, but especially with the leaders in research performing organizations or projects. Researchers' morals alone cannot ensure research integrity. Good conditions for exercising integrity must also be created at the level of the organizations. And that is an important last thing to really stress, I think. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to discuss this with you. Hope you enjoy the presentation.